I have been again. <laughs> All right. So somebody somebody figured out a quick way to get to the top of uh, random topics to bring up brewing, whether it's coffee or beer. Um, you can usually get me talking pretty well on that. Um, so some I just went through. I still haven't graded the quizzes because I was working on on the um, lecture slides this morning instead. Um, but I went through and I looked at the first half of all the questions to get all the relevant questions and a few random ones. Um, the trick with brewing a cup of coffee <laughs> is that there's a lot of ways to brew a cup of coffee. It depends on what device you're using, really, what grind you want to use. Um, it depends on the pressure. It depends on it depends on the water quality as well. To get as consistent as possible, you really should be using distilled water. Um, if you really want to get into coffee quality and like the people that go way beyond what I think is actually reasonable, it's it's kind of like those people that are really into vinyl because they think it sounds better, like audio files. Like they're talking about stuff that you know very, very few people, if anybody, can actually tell the difference. And same is true with people that taste wine, people that taste coffee at that level. Um, but the really, really serious coffee makers will tell you you have to use distilled water because the ions, the minerals that are in your tap water will affect the extraction of the coffee. You'll get different things because you've got a different level of what's called residual alkalinity. Um, and residual alkalinity basically means that your tap water is buffered by the minerals that are in it. And if it's buffered, that means it's going to resist change. And coffee is, is, is acidic. And so by having different mineral content, you'll actually you'll actually change how well you extract certain comp flavor compounds based on the pH. Um, can you tell the difference with coffee? Probably if you get a, if you get really, really specific and you're really consistent about everything else. You could probably tell the difference between something brewed with distilled water versus um, probably not our water because our water is pretty close to distilled water in terms of mineral content. There's very little mineral content in our water up here. Um, but if you look at something like the Bay Area or LA or something like that, where they have a lot of basically any place where the water tastes bad, that's mostly because of residual um, minerals that are in it. Um, and all of that can can affect the taste of the coffee. Uh, it actually affects brewing beer more than it, than it affects making coffee because amylase, the enzyme that breaks down starch and turns it into glucose and makes it fermentable, works better at a certain pH range. There's two versions of amylase um, that are present in malt and barley, and, but they both work best, I think it's between 4.8 and 5.2. But it's been a long time since I brewed beer, so you might want to look that up before you actually try and use that as any calculation or anything. But that actually means that you have to change what types of grains you use to brew beer based on where you're getting your water from. But there's a reason that Guinness brewed in it's brewed in Dublin, and up and like Pilsners are brewed in Germany, and it's because of the difference in water quality. Dublin is a river town at the mouth of the river. Their water is pretty garbage. It's got lots of stuff in it. So they needed to use more acidic um, grains like toasted barley instead of just malted barley. And that means you get, um, you get darker colored beers because you had to fight that residual alkalinity in order for the amylase to actually be effective when you're mashing and turning your starches into glucose. Um, if you want to brew a really, really light beer, pale beer, you need very little minerals in your water, or else it just doesn't work because the amylase won't work. So there's a lot of science that goes into both coffee and beer. Um, basically, figure out a way that you like to brew coffee and then just do it consistently. I have a, a thing called an AeroPress, which is basically like a cross between, it's like three pieces of plastic. It's super simple, but it uses a filter paper. so. Um, it's it's kind of like like an espresso mixed with pour over coffee. Um, you pour over it and then you push a plunger down on it, and so you apply pressure like an espresso machine. Um, and it's got a paper a filter paper in it, and so it actually pulls a lot of that oily stuff that you get on the top of like French press coffee or um, pour over coffee. It pulls a lot of that oil out with the paper. 
Um, I like that because it's really, really simple and really, really reliable. And you can travel with it, you camp with it. All you need to do is be able to boil water and have coffee grounds. And it really doesn't even matter what the grind is on the coffee. Um, but that's what I found works for me. But yeah, it's one of those things where you can dive into it online, find people that are really passionate about it, and like you know, find an FAQ or a start here page somewhere and uh, try some different stuff because there's some really good. So 25 uh, grams of coffee to 450 grams of water does me good. There you go. So the, and the, the people that are serious about coffee will do it in grams rather than in tablespoons or scoops because the different grind will have a different density because you'll have more air. If you have larger grains of coffee, larger pieces of coffee, um, you'll have more air in it. So you wind up with the density being different. Personally, though, due to ease in how many other things I have going on in my life, I just buy the pre-ground stuff at the grocery store and I do two scoops. I do four scoops for eight ounces of coffee and then I add hot water to it um, to get it to about 20 ounces. But that's what works for me. Find what works for you, what you like. Um, and then tell me about it. And I like hearing about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Expert. I suppose I'll <laughs> I really like the AeroPress, and I like telling the story because it's basically um, a bunch of chemical engineers, not a bunch, several chemical engineers from Stanford um, that decided to, to uh, they watched, they were watching Breaking Bad, and they got that episode where Gail brews the perfect cup of coffee in what, season two or something like that. And they're like, we can, we can do better than that. Like, that looks cool for the TV show and everything, but we can design a better, simple, simpler system than that. Uh, in the AeroPress is what they came up to. So it is really a bunch of um, engineers, as they're known, um, that uh, just decided, hey, we can we can make a really good cup of coffee with just a few cup pieces of plastic and filter paper. Um, and for my money, it's like 35 bucks. And it's you don't, you three pieces of plastic. Them. What's that? You don't secretly work for them? No, I don't secretly yeah. work for them. Um, I had an we had an espresso machine on our counter for a long time, but our everyday coffee maker was just it was a French press. How oh, the word is you still want to popular with like backpacking because it's like super yes. heavy and like light. Yeah. And I like the pour over, and I don't think there's a lot of acidity in it. It's not like a French press. Backpacking coffee always just tastes like soup and it's cold. <laughs> you pour, pour hot water. This is the inverted method, um, which I don't like as much because it's a little bit grainier. I don't like gritty coffee. Um, but basically, you pour, you fill up, put your coffee down here, and it comes with a pre measured scoop. But and then you just pour hot water over it. You don't even have to get it to boiling 80 Celsius. So I have a little IR thermometer in the, in the kitchen that we use. And then you just pour hot water on it, give it a good stir with the filter paper on it, and then you just push down on the plunger really hard. Um, I stir mine a little more than that, let it steep a little bit more. And I don't go get up to 93 Celsius, I do it about 80 Celsius. Um, and I also don't wait. If you go 80 Celsius and you stir for 15 seconds, that's actually all the time it needs. And then you just plunge it and, it, and you get really, really sweet coffee. Because the longer you let it steep, the more bitter it comes out. And then, lunch. She looks happy. She's having dinner. Yeah. 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 This, this <laughs> is a sponsor. Oh, I didn't realize they were getting sponsored by Starbucks these days. Good for them. Get that Starbucks money. Um, Starbucks just reported like really low earnings for a lot of quarter, and they lost it, dropped like 12%. It's because everybody figured out that they can make the arrow press at home. <laughs> um, anyway, so somebody else asked, what's the difference between a regular light bulb and LED light bulb? Regular light bulbs, so old school incandescent light bulbs were really, really inefficient. It was basically just a resistor. That, that filament in an incandescent light bulb is just a, a resistor that we pass current through it. It gets really, really hot. And when things get really, really hot, they glow. Um, so those were really inefficient. That's why 
I don't know how many of you actually grew up with incandescent bulbs in the house, but you burn yourself on them really easily. Turn it off and then go to, to switch it out or something like that. Um, you could really burn yourself pretty, pretty well. And even worse, it was really thin glass. And so when you put your finger on it, you could shatter it just from the difference in the temperature. When you do that, so you burn yourself and now there's, there's growing hot it's flying everywhere as well. Um, so those, those did not work as well. LEDs are basically the exact opposite of a solar cell. Solar, a photovoltaic cell takes in light and turns it into current by using a voltage difference. Right, we talked a little bit about that. Where you have your two energy levels. Um, if we had electrons up here and then if we allowed them to pack, go downhill in energy, if we hooked up a circuit to that, we had, we had a circuit, right? That's the whole principle with how batteries work. Um, if you promote the electrons from the low energy to the high energy by using light, the same way we did, we talked about back when you first learned about orbitals, um, that's how a photovoltaic cell works. That's how a, a solar cell generates electricity from light. You promote the electron instead of letting it fall back down to give off the photon again, you have it wired up to a circuit so it charges a battery instead. If you do the exact opposite, if you apply a voltage to, to a semiconductor, you get the exact opposite. You promote the electron using the voltage and then let it fall back down and generate a photon. So semiconductors are really, really diodes in general, are really, really useful technology. And the only thing that's different between turning them into lighting versus using them to generate electricity is, are you supplying the light or are you supplying the voltage? You wire them up differently and you can actually use the same material in both applications, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then there was that middle technology, the, the compact fluorescent bulbs, which is basically just a giant halogen um, that where they got creative with how they wrapped up the glass and made it the same shape as an old school incandescent bulb. Um, but those I don't think are nearly as common anymore. They still are still out there. You can still buy them. But LEDs are, are the way, way of the future because they work best at this point. And they're really, really cheap to make. And they're really, really easy to fine tune that that wavelength so that it looks more like natural light. Fluorescence even um, and LEDs in, in rooms like this are way better than they used to be. Um, just when I first started grad school, you know, I had to spend hours and hours and hours every week working on my research in a room lit only with old school green fluorescence. And I still blame that for why my eyes got so bad from 20 to 26. Um, and because of spending so much time under really crappy old cheap fluorescence. So LEDs are, are the way to go. Plus they're way more efficient, cheaper to use. Um, the question about microbiology, I threw this in here before because I misread it first and I thought pH, I saw pH and thought um, DNA. And I can know a little bit more about genomics and genetics than I know about protozoa in general. Um, but probably what's happening here is why you can have different things living in the same area or in the same ecosystem, that, but they prefer different pHs. Is there's just some overlap in the bell curve where they can where they can survive. They're going to survive best at different pHs, but there's some overlap between those two ranges where they can both survive, even if maybe neither of them is thriving, but they can both be, be there. Just like there's some overlap in the, in the climate that say a, a um, humans and polar bears can live in. Polar bears do best at much colder climates than humans can live at, and humans do best in much warmer climate than polar bears can live at, but there's some overlap in where both species can survive at a reasonable level, even if it's not ideal for either species. Um, if you mean the, the pHs of the cytoplasm inside the microbiota or the microbes, then I don't, it's, that's more about, about the different enzymes they have that regulate their own internal pH. Um, last, not least on the random questions front, 
our rate reactions used to calculate the point at which the universe will reach absolute zero. They don't call it absolute zero because it's actually not absolute zero. Things don't cease motion. Things stop happening because everything is uniform. So they actually call it the heat death of the universe. The heat death of the universe is when all the atoms in the universe are on average equally spread apart from each other. When all, in theory, when everything is spread out completely and all the entropy of the universe is maximized, all atoms will be equally spread apart from all other atoms, which means nothing can really happen at that point. Hard to have chemical reactions happen when you've got one atom per square per cubic mile or something like that, much bigger than that even really. Um, but they refer to that as heat death. So if you want to know more about the calculations that they use, um, you can look up heat death of the universe on Wikipedia and read all the backstory about it. It's pretty interesting. Um, but it does involve making some assumption about how the universe works. So we don't actually know that that's going to happen. That's just the current theory, given how dark energy is accelerating um, universes away from each other and how the second law of thermodynamics works. Um, that there is some theoretical maximum entropy. And once you reach that theoretical maximum entropy, nothing else can happen. Relevant questions. Um, out of the way. Are there typical characteristics associated with first, second, third order reactions? Well, yeah, there's that whole plot the concentration versus time and see which version gives you a straight line that we'll do some more practice with um, try to understand it. But um, in general, the, the order of a reaction tells us something about how the reaction happens. Um, and that kind of goes into the second question when it comes to order reactions, how exactly does it have an effect on the overall reaction? Why is it important? Managed to lose one of these already. I should probably make sure I don't lose the other one. Okay. That's quick. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so this is that this is a topic that I was I was gonna just kind of touch on briefly. I'm not likely to ask any time class questions, but maybe on the take home test. Um, basically, if you have a multi step reaction. If the overall reaction looks like A plus B goes to C, the, the order of the reaction tells us something about the steps involved getting there. If this is a one-step reaction, then it's going to have a really simple potential energy surface that just looks like this is the energy of A and B. There's some um, activation or some transition state that looks like a lot of times we represent it as, as uh, AB star like A and B ran into each other you're in the process of, of changing configurations or sticking together. And then you make C as a product. If this is the, the potential energy surface for this reaction, the rate law has to involve both A and B because they have to run into each other for this to happen. And so knowing that if we know that the rate for this reaction is K times concentration of A times concentration of B, that tells us something about the mechanism. This the process by which you get from A, from uh, reactants to products is called the mechanism, the actual process of the reaction. If this is our rate law, this tells us this is consistent with a one-step mechanism. But if we had some some other rate law, if we had a rate law that looked like If our rate law just looked at rate equals k times a squared and didn't involve b at all, <laughs> but the balanced reaction has b in it, that tells us that there's a more complicated mechanism happening here. Maybe a has to run into a and you make some other intermediate that looks like two a's fused together and then that has to run into b. And that running into b is a faster process than a running into a. So Basically, the, the overall rate law for the reaction is why we can get some 
if, if everything was a one-step reaction, the rate log would be really, really simple. And we wouldn't really worry about it. It'd be really straightforward. But then again, we wouldn't have things like this. A rate log that looks like this for a reaction that looks like A plus B. Um, and if we have multiple if we have multiple steps like a plus a makes um, just call it double a and then double a plus b turns into c if this is this is fast but this is slow our slow step is our rate determining step. Our slow step is the step that's actually going to determine the rate law. So in this case, if this is slow, but this is fast, then our rate law would look like the second one I put up there, rate equals K times A squared. And it gets even more interesting if we switch which step is slow and which step is fast. If, because the second step If the second step is the rate determining step. So this is our slow step and this is fast. Well, now our rate is dependent on concentration of this intermediate A or double A times concentration of B. But our concentration of double A intermediates are tricky. We can't actually measure the concentration of intermediates necessarily. So really, if this is fast and this is slow, we actually have an equilibrium process happening up here. Which makes this whole thing more complicated, right? Because that means that our concentration of A of double A is in equilibrium with the, this reaction here. So we actually wind up with a K for the forward reaction and K for the reverse reaction. So called K1 and K minus one. And then you got a whole different um, K value K2 for the second step. We can actually do some algebra here because if we can say, okay, well, if the rate for the forward reaction up to forward fast reaction is going to be a squared times k1. And if it's at equilibrium, that's equal to the backwards rate, right? So it's equal to k minus 1 times concentration of double A. This gives us something we can measure that we could then plug in for double A here. And we could solve this. If this is a rate constant, that's a rate constant. And those are two concentrations. We can say, okay, well, that means that concentration of double A is equal to K1 over K minus one times concentration of A squared. Right? You see how I did that substitute, or just did the algebra to solve for this? And then we can take this whole thing and plug it in there. We get a much more complicated rate law, right? Our combined rate law now would look like our overall rate law would look like K2 times K1 over K minus 1 times concentration of A squared concentration of B. Well, those are all still just constants, right? So we can just combine them to make one combined rate constant. But the point is, is that we got a reaction that was second order in A and first order in B for what looks on the surface like it's a pretty straightforward process. If it looked like that, then our net reaction still just looks like A plus B goes to C. But we get a much more complicated rate law based on the mechanisms. So that's one of the reasons why these rate laws don't always match up with, well, why don't we just use the stoichiometry? Why is it more complicated than that? 
Why do we even need the method of initial rates? Because not everything is a simple one-step reaction. If everything was a simple one-step reaction, you'd be absolutely right. It is just as simple as look at what bangs into each other and make a rate law from it. But since everything in reality is more complicated than that, and we have lots of different possibilities for these mechanisms, we can get much more complicated rate laws. Um, the whole idea of a fast step that's at equilibrium followed by a slow step is something that comes up a lot in organic chemistry. Because in organic chemistry, it has a ton of mechanisms that are four-step mechanisms. And the third step is the slow step. And that means your first two steps are both equilibrium process. Your third step is the slow step and your fourth step never even reaches equilibrium because it's much faster than the third step. And that leads to really complicated rate laws as a result. And that's also related to how enzyme kinetics works. Enzyme kinetics work the same way. I keep hinting at things are gonna get more complicated when you get to enzyme kinetics. It's because it has multi-step processes. You have to, the enzyme has to find the substrate. That's an equilibrium process. Once it finds the substrate, then it, you have a second step that's faster, and then it has to release the product. And that's actually a step that has a rate function associated with it. Combining all of these into one expression is tricky. All right, these last two I think are relatively quick to answer. If a rate somehow becomes negative, does that mean the reaction is going the other direction? It could be more likely in this class with the call the, the sanitized version of, of science that you're going to give you in these practice problems. I'm not going to give you a tricky problem where the rate becomes negative. Because in, in, in theory, unless you have a Le Chatelier situation going on, you should your rate should be positive and then you'll hit equilibrium and then nothing happens, right? You shouldn't get a negative rate until unless you're at equilibrium and then disturb equilibrium to cause the rate, the reaction to go the other way. So it's more likely in this class, if you have a negative, you calculate a negative rate, you missed the negative sign somewhere um, in all likelihood, because you should, we're not dealing with the complicated systems like it's at equilibrium and then we apply Le Chatelier's principle and use and then do rates. We're for the most part talking about the rates before it gets to equilibrium, not starting from equilibrium and then changing things. That's trickier mathematically. And then um, this is another case of if the concentration doesn't change, but the rate is double, what order is that? That's the you know, if the concentration doesn't change and the rate is double, something's wrong. Um, and it might be that you're looking at the wrong compound. Maybe the concentration of one compound doubled, and then the rate doubled, but something else stayed the same. If one thing stays the same, but the rate changes, something else changed. Right? Because this is not, you can't have the rate, I guess, we're not, we're not talking about temperature yet, so we're still keeping everything at a constant temperature. If your rate doubled, something changed in terms of your concentration. One of the concentrations had to change. Um, same here, with the, if the rate is multiplied by two, if the, and I think that's a typo. I didn't mean to include that one. When the rate is multiplied by two and the rate is divided by two, if one of these, if the rate is multiplied by two and the concentration is divided by two, if your concentration went down, but your rate went up, again, you're missing something double check the other concentrations that are happening. Or we're, we've got an issue where the temperature is changing. We're going to talk about effective temperature more explicitly today. That's our, our main topic today. Um, because that Boltzmann distribution means that you can have a somewhat exponential relationship between temperature and rate. And like to a, a point. catalyst cause like an inverse relationship between the concentration and the reaction rate? Not inverse. So, uh, so in catalysts, if we're talking about enzymes, enzymes are really complicated because sometimes the substrate for an enzyme reaction is also an inhibitor 
in another way, it can actually bind. If you have too much of a substrate, it can bind to an enzyme in two different places, the normal active site, and then also in another spot that slows the reaction down to say, hey, don't, don't worry about this as much if there's something else going on. So basically there's a lot of signaling back and forth between enzymes and molecules and concentrations and living systems, which is why I'm hesitating to just say no. But in general, if you add a catalyst, we wouldn't call it a catalyst for starters. If it's going to slow the rate down, we wouldn't call it a catalyst. Um, and you got me in one of those where I want to give you an absolute answer, but I'm, I'm hedging. Um, I can't think of a case where you have a catalyst where increasing concentration in the presence of the catalyst slows the reaction down. In theory, mathematically, it's possible, but in the real world, no. Um, all right. Any other random or quiz questions that are relevant to this stuff that I've, we've been talking about that you want to throw out now, or you can wait until Thursday when I finish going through the rest of the quizzes? Yeah. Ha. Thank you. I should have expected, I don't look on the floor for stuff when I'm not at my house. My house, that's the number one go-to because I have an 18 month old who loves to climb on things. We have luckily a really sturdy coffee table, but the 10 year old and the eight year old have gotten into the habit when we play loud music, they get on the coffee table and dance. <laughs> And the 18 month old has followed suit. And he just, and so now when he wants to have a dance party, he just climbs onto the coffee table and spins in circles and sings to himself. And singing just sounds like do, 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 do. So he just shouts do, 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 and spins in circles on the coffee table. Um, which is why everything winds up on the floor, including him. All right, let's talk about the pre lab a little bit. Yes, this was, it was, it's a little bit, it's not tricky to get the final answer as far as what orders the reaction, right? But actually getting a number for the rate, which is part of the problem, um, is a little bit tricky because it has that relationship to the thiosulfate. And Zane and Jackson, you weren't, you weren't around when I figured, when I figured this out. Um, or remembered it rather, since I knew it before at one point. Um, but there is a stoichiometry component. We're not using up all of the bromine. We're using up all of the thiocyanate. Right. Sorry, I keep saying that. The, all of the thiosulfate, the S2O3. That's our limiting reactant in that these two reactions, again, it's a two-step process, Iodine showing up is what's going to cause our color change. The slow reaction produces iodine. And the fast reaction uses up iodine. So the fast reaction stops the color change from happening. When you run out of when you run out of the thiocyanate is when the color change happens. So our change in our bromate concentration that we're using as the rate for the slow reaction is actually based on how much thiosulfate we have, not based on how much bromate we have. All right, so figuring out the initial concentrations is not, is not too bad. You're given starting concentrations and starting volumes and everything. Right, and one of the things that's handy to recognize is that in all of them, your, your thiosulfate concentration is going to remain the same in all of them. They all have a total volume of 50 milliliters. And so your, your moles that are being used is going to be the same for all of them. It's just based on this, not on, on this, because this is part of the reaction we want to study. So we want to be able to change our bromate concentration. 
And plus, if we're trying to, if we are not waiting for the reaction to get to equilibrium, we actually want to measure just the rate while the reaction is still happening. So we have this present in much smaller amounts than everything else, so that this runs out while the rest of the reaction is still happening. All right, so finding the iodine concentration, pretty straightforward for solution two. Uh, reaction mixture two, we have 20 mils of iodine, so 0 0.020 liters times our starting concentration, 0 0.010 molar, divided by our final concentration, or our final volume, which is 50 milliliters. All right, so we can do that for all of them. For the iodine reaction two, is this the one that's eight? 0.0 times 10 to the minus 3? 4.4. Four point. Four point. Thank you. <laughs> and the bromate concentration is 8.0. <laughs> And our hydronium concentration is much more than that, right? Yeah. Into the minus two. Yeah. So if we want to find the rate of the first reaction. Based on how much thiosulfate is used up, we, we just say, okay, well, all of this is being used up and use that to work backwards to do the stoichiometry. You say, okay, well, if I know 2.0 times 10 to the minus four moles per liter, I'm just gonna separate the molarity and moles per liter because we're not changing the overall volume at this point, right? So we can treat the molarity and the moles like they're the same thing for, for all intents and purposes. That's moles of thiosulfate. And for every, and that's how many moles of thiosulfate are used in the first, in 75 seconds. Then we can say, okay, well, every, every six moles of thiosulfate used, it means three moles of iodine used And then continue that on that for every three moles of iodine used, that's one mole of bromate used. No <laughs> sneezing. <laughs> So that's what's going to give us our, our actual rate. It's so going to take the amount of thiosulfate, and the net result is we're going to divide by six to get our, our moles of bromate use or molarity of bromate use. And so that winds up being. Three point three point three and to the minus five. So we actually don't even if we if we set it up right, we assume we're using all of our thiosulfate, we don't actually need to do final minus initial for the bromate because if we know that we're using all of this, this is the amount of bromate we're, used, if we're using. In other words, this is the change in the molarity of the bromate as well. So then our final rate
is just going to be Why do we choose to use bromate as our as our rate rate of reaction indicator rather than one of the others? Because it's got a coefficient of one. So one mole of bromate being used means the reaction happened one mole of times. Otherwise, we're going to wind up with a random six term in there. You don't have to do it that way. But it makes the most sense since we have something that has a coefficient of one in the reactant side, we might as well use that as, as the way we're, we're um, showing our stoichiometry. So this is our change in, and really this should have a negative in front of it because it's bromate used. Now if they pair the negative there, we'll get a negative of a negative to get a positive reaction overall. over 75 seconds. It's, what are our units? Molarity per liter per second. Yeah, moles per liter per second or molarity per second. So for your data that you're given, the rate for a reaction mixture two is going to be what five times ten to the minus seven? Four point four times ten to the minus seven. like I mentioned, I mentioned to everybody as well, figuring out the order of reaction with respect to the iodine doesn't mean that you actually need to have the rate calculated properly. You'll need the rate calculated properly to get full credit since it asks you what's the rate of the reaction. Um, but all you really need to do is see that it's, that it's first order in iodide is that reaction mixture two has twice as much iodide in it compared to reaction mixture one. And reaction mixture two takes 75 seconds and reaction mixture one, it's under the icon there, takes 145 seconds. So that's enough. If, since that's nice clean numbers, it's not perfectly double the amount of time, it's close to double the amount of time, right? So since we have the same amount of thiocyanate and everything, that means that the, that the numerator of our rate equation is the same in every single reaction mixture, right? Which means if the reaction takes twice as long, the rate is half. Because it's nice, clean numbers, because we picked doubling, doubling and halving is pretty easy to wrap your head around. Um, if it wasn't nice, clean numbers, or if this amount of thio thiocyanate changed, we would have to go through this process and be really diligent about finding the actual rate every time. And finding the actual rate every time is going to rely on us going through that stoichiometry step to get the real numbers. But as long as it's nice, clearly powers of two, it's not strictly speaking necessary just to get to the final answer, which is your rate law. And this, the free lab doesn't give you enough information to get to the full, the full um, rate law, right? Because it's iodine, iodide, and bromine, and H plus. Right? So our overall rate law is going to be something like concentration of iodide to the X, concentration of bromate to the Y, concentration of H plus 
to be Z. The pre-lab is only enough information to get you X because we didn't, it didn't give us any data about the other reaction mixtures. So we don't have a way to figure out Y and Z because they are being held constant in both in reaction mixture one and reaction mixture two. If there's no change in bromate, no change in, in H plus, we don't know what their order is going to be. And so that's the, what we're gonna find out on Wednesday or Thursday, depending on your lab section. I have a question. Um, yeah. In mixture one, they also add a little bit of water. Yes. Uh, to keep the volumes consistent, but doesn't that change the molarity of everything around it? Like all the other- Not things? if we include it in our 0 0.05 liters. If we didn't add the water, then we would be dividing the rest of these other reaction mixtures would be divided by 0 0.05, but reaction mixture one would be divided by 0 0.04. I was just thinking like, wouldn't it change the values of the molarity for the potassium? Well, the all of the initial volumes are the same for all of them, because the initial volume is when you're pulling it out of the jar. When you're pulling it out of, of the jar on the cart, it's 0 0.01 molar. So adding water is not going to change the 0 0.01 molar. It's going to change your final volume. And since it's water we're adding and the water doesn't have any of these other components in it, all that you're effectively doing by adding water is changing the final volume, not changing anything else. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on the pre-lab? All right, then let's look at the integrated rate loss. <clears throat> I suppose um, we're going to work on this and we come back. So just a quick recap of, of integrated rate loss, and we'll take a quick a break, and we'll come back and do some practice problems. And then we'll talk about the Arrhenius equation. All right, so if a reaction in, in your, the textbook has basically one sentence about about uh, if it's first order in A and first order in B, what do you do when it comes to figuring out which one of these you use? Turns out that's an even more complicated system than anything we've looked at so far. So basically our integrated rate laws don't apply if we have a reaction that's first order in A and first order in B. We can't use one of these. These are for, if it's zero order, if it's zero order, that's easy. If it's first order in one, and zero order and everything else. Or if it's second order in one component and zero order and everything else. If it's first order in A and first order in B, this doesn't apply. There's a much more complicated integral that you have to do in order to do that because it's going to involve partial differentials because you've got the change in rate with respect to the change in concentration A at a constant B plus the change in rate with respect to the change in concentration of B at constant A. And then you have to add those two terms together um, and then take the integral of that. And it winds up being a double integral because you have to integrate with respect to both variables in that case. Um, so we're staying away from that. Um, and, and your textbook, because I was anticipating a question like, well, what about if it's, for, is it, which one do we use if it's first order in A and first order in B? And your textbook literally has one sentence saying, the math gets too tricky, so let's look at these. <laughs> so if we know that it's first order in A and zero order in everything else, or if it's, I, we can use this if it's first order in A and first order in B, as long as your concentration of B is constant forever. If your concentration of B is not going to change over the course of the entire reaction study, you can treat it like it's first order in A and that B doesn't matter. Right? But when A it's first order in A and B and they're both changing, that's when it gets too complicated for us to do the math for. Um, it has a little thing in here in terms of the units of the rate constant, but again, we don't pay that much attention to it. The integrated rate law winds up being really useful 
And this is for each of these, this is the version of it that you can plot to get a straight line. So if you if it's zero order, all you have to do is plot concentration of A versus time, and you'll get a straight line. If it's first order, you plot the natural log of A versus time, and you get a straight line. If it's second order, you plot one over A versus T, and you get a straight line. And for each of them, the rate constant is going to be tied to the equation for that line. For these first ones, you get K is the negative of the slope, K is the negative of the slope, K is the positive of the slope if it's second order, but that's because when you integrate, um, when you do the integral for a second order reaction, there's a negative term that pops up. And then this, so this table is out also in the textbook, in the chapter on integrated rate loss, in the, the section on integrated rate loss, has this table already there for you. I'm not going to give you this whole table on the, um, on the test. I'm at least going to give you this, though. If you know that, that has the rest of this information in it, if you know how to use it, right? Um, the last piece that I'll point out is for the half-life for each of them. If it's zero order, your half-life is the initial amount of A divided by two times rate constant. For a second order reaction, it's one over your rate, your initial concentration times K. And if it's first order reaction, we had a number that doesn't involve our initial amount at all. So for first order reactions, those are the ones where the rate or where the half-life is a constant, no matter how much you start with, A naught does not show up in our expression for T, T one half here because of our laws of logs, if we wind up combining these to get A over A naught, we're just gonna natural log of 0.5 on one side, which is 0.693. So the linear form of first order rate law looks like We subtract both of those, or subtract natural log of A naught from both, and you get natural log, and then we can combine them because laws of logs allows us to do this. And at the half life, A is half of A naught. So for minus K times T one half, equals natural log of 0.5 A naught <clears throat> over A naught. So laws of logs is working in our favor in this case because it actually lets us cancel those out. And we just get natural log of 0.5 equals minus KT. And natural log of 0.5 is 693.693. It's actually, there's a negative in there because I, I skipped over moving the negative over. Um, natural log of 0.5 is negative 0.693. A negative of a negative. Since we, just, we can just cancel them out. We get this term. So for zero order and first order, the half-life depends on how much you started with. But for first order reactions, they say zero order and first order, zero order and second order, it depends on how much you started with. For first order reactions, it doesn't matter how much you start with, the half life is the same. All right, let's take our break. Come back at five after, and we'll practice using some of these. So we are. Thank you. 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 Thank
Uh, let me look at the schedule because it makes the most sense to do nuclear mechanics. So with this, all the nuclear reactions are first order processes. As we want to follow what we're doing, the cost of the problem is with my question of being set. I don't know what we want to do, but let me look at the schedule. Okay, so I get the answer. I'm going to do the same. Can you do it one of them? No, you just boil it. Do you want to like hurt the fire? So what game are we watching today, Sean? I just thought I'd share a comic I found today. I don't think the Giants played yesterday. I just I thought this was pretty funny. It's somewhat science related and history related. <laughs> Those kebabs were <laughs> Why wouldn't you like entomology? I don't know, it made me laugh this morning. That's a good one. Oh, because he's the impaler. Okay. I had to bring it back. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
David, you know David Escobar? Yeah. He collects bugs. He collects butterflies. He's out there stabbing them flies. There's um one of the one of the students is the reason that we now offer the OCAM series. You get a really, really strong student who really liked chemistry sequence and wanted to transfer to Davis to be a chemistry major, but they he, they would not accept him as a chemistry major because he didn't have OCAM, which is traditionally a second year class. Yeah. Um, so he, but he wound up transferring as an entomology major. Um, I always worry I'm saying that one wrong. It's entomology and entomology. Entomology. Yeah. And entomology. Um, because he loved fly fishing so much. And if you know what the hatch is doing, you know what the sure. shark is crawling around. Sure. 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 You know, fish out. Sure. It's got paint on it. Yeah. Well, what's that? Why do you have paint on it? Are you painting? I've, I've been a painter before. Just take a shirt to uh, get rid of it. Just keep it. Teach it. Why wouldn't you? Can you eat chili over there? Get that beef fish, man. Yeah. <laughs> you can sell it. Chicken drop. A lot of money. Just make some. People want used clothes these days. I know. It's why I got I want the clothes I used. Well, the way the economy and concert ticket prices are these days, the only way I can afford it in is if I find it at Goodwill. So, yeah. You want to buy my shirt license? No. That was winning those lines. 40 bucks. It's not a good enough band. 40 bucks. It's not a good enough band on your shirt. Well, I'll put a couple of bucks. Swaps of red on it. What is that? Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Put a wear a shirt with me. No. How about blue? You think good would work? I don't like blue. Blue? <laughs> I do like blue. That was crazy. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, it was like the only color I wanted. <laughs> so here's a practice problem. I'll have everybody, let's in small groups or on your own if you feel like it. Um, but at least compare your answer to somebody else. This word problem has everything you need to figure out what is the, um, the partial pressure in the container after 215 minutes. Watch your units. We're mentioning that because it's, because um, just like with equilibrium, just because pressure is proportional to concentration, we can actually do it in, because it's first order, especially any concentration unit work. Right? So, in, and in any concentration units includes pressure units, because pressure units are concentration units. They're proportional to concentration units anyway, right? If you know it's first order, you know what the half life is, that's enough to figure out K. If you figure out K, you can figure out your concentration after any set amount of time. So I'll give you a few minutes to do this and we'll go through it.
Hayek in Empirical Economics Meet Damages. That not much progress is being made. Okay. <laughs> so, and that's fine, but I don't want anybody meeting their head against the brick wall or feeling totally lost. We're just sitting here quietly. I'd feel better if there was more discussion happening. I'll let the discussion go on, if as long as it's related to the problem. Um, when it gets quiet, I feel the need to step in. So, after the half life, if it's a first order, regardless if it's a first order processor, at the half life, you have half as much material as you started with, half as much reactants as you started. So, we are given a half life at a certain temperature, but the temperature doesn't really matter in this case. It's just telling us that the temperature is a constant. At 2.18 hours, you have half of what you started with. And since it's a first order reaction, we can plug in, okay, well, that means that at 2. Point, we'll fill in the other side first. We don't know what K is, but we know that the half life is 2.81 hours. And we know that at the half life, at 2.81 hours, we have half as much A as we started with. So regardless of how much A we start with, well, so we can just still call it A naught. And at the half life, at 2.81 hours, we have half of what we started. Because by that's the definition of the half life, right? Half of what we started with. And if it's first order right, uh, reaction, we know we have these two in the same part of the same fraction because of our, our um, laws of logs, we can wind up with this canceling out. And so we just get natural log of 0.5 equals negative K times 2.81 hours. That's enough to solve for K. Because natural log of 0.5 is just a number. We can find that on our calculator, right? Then we're gonna divide both sides by negative T, by negative 2.81 hours, and we'll get K is equal to 0.247 hours to the minus one. You got a negative, but then, so when you take on that log, natural log of 25, it's negative 0.693. But then there's a negative right here in the equation. So you got a negative canceling a negative. K can never be negative. If K is negative, then you missed a negative sign somewhere. Or you measured something wrong. But basically, you missed the negative somewhere, basically. All right, so we feel better about finding K from the half life. Because it's the original version of our integrated rate law has this minus KT, which is just part of the integration process. Because we're measuring our reaction in terms of how much A we have, and A is a reactant, so it's being used up. And so there's an inherent negative associated with that, just like with our, uh, with our pre-lab. We said that the rate was equal to negative concentration of bromine over delta T. And negative is because this is a reactant that's being used up. So then when you take the integral of the whole thing, the reaction rate always has to be positive, even if the reactant is being used up. So the change in concentration of a reactant is going to be negative because you're using it up. You have less at the end than you did when you started with it. So you wind up meeting a negative in front of it to indicate that the overall reaction has a positive rate, even though our change in concentration of A is a negative number. When you carry that forward into doing the, the uh, integration, you get a negative number that winds up sticking with the K.
if this was not a first order reaction, we would need an initial amount for A naught in order to get K. We would need to know how much we started with. If you look at each of these integrated rate laws, if you solve for T one half, both of these two versions have A naught in them. So you need a number to plug in in order to get your actual half life for zero order or second. But because this one is first order, that's the only version of the rate law where your, your initial amount cancels out in the rate law expression. All right, so is everybody feeling okay getting the K from the rate law, or sorry, from the um, half life? So once we have K, how are we going to solve the rest of this? Plug in everything else that we know, that we know right? We know K now. We know T. It's in minutes now, and our K is in hours. So we either got to convert K into minute into inverse minutes, or we have to convert our 215 minutes into hours. But either way, that's just a one-step conversion, right? Converting minutes to hours. And then we have an initial amount of seven of uh, 745 core of nitrogen pentoxide. So there's our concentration of A naught. There's T. We just solved for K. So solving for A, just plug and chug. It does involve logs. So be careful if you're not comfortable with logs, even if you are probably worth paying attention to. We, can we stay in tour? We can stay in tour. Anything that's to cancel because it's going to cancel. So as long as we're consistent, any pressure units, anything that's proportional to molarity, we can use. So we could use grams per cubic centimeter if we wanted to. We can use tor. We can use any pressure units as long as we're consistent. So what is T in hours? What is it? Three, 3.58. Then we'll get Natural log of concentration of A over 745 torr equals minus 0.247 hours minus one times 3.58 hours. Just ballparking. Ballparking this, and this is also useful because we're gonna when we start talking about um, nuclear activity and radioactive dating, all radioactive reactions are first order, all the same kinetics, and all which means every nuclear reaction has its own constant half life. So a lot of times you hear people talking about things in terms of how many half lives does some does it take. Because every half life counts what was left, right? So after one half life, you have half of what you started with. After two half lives, you have half of that, which would be a quarter, right? After three half lives, you have an eighth of what you started with. After four half lives, you have a sixteenth, and so on. It's always just going to be in powers of two. But that means it's pretty easy to guess if we do everything right. 
One half life was 2.81 hours. Two half lives is going to be five point something, right? So we're between one half life and two half lives, which means our final answer here should be somewhere between a quarter and a half of what we started with, if we do our math right. It's a good reasonableness check. So what do we get? Got 307 for the partial pressure. 307. That seems reasonable according to that that check we just did, right? Because half of this is going to be, you know, 375 ish. So we're we're between 375 and half of 375. But the temperature and the reaction vessel volume, that doesn't matter. In this. It doesn't in this case. It means we could actually use PV equals NRT to get two moles per liter if we wanted to, but we don't need to. As long as we know that these two numbers are constant, that the volume of the container is constant, and the temperature is constant, then we can just use predator units instead. What did you say it was, Edward? Uh, 307. Seven or seventy? Seven. Thank you. Still see some perplexed faces, but I see some faces that seem like they're getting it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So Wolfram Alpha is fair, but if you're if you're on the test like, yeah. you don't have Wolfram Alpha. Um, what I the other thing I will say is that you can still use the solver on your calculator on the test, but you should know how to use it. So be practicing with whatever calculator you're going to be using on the test if you're going to try, especially if you're going to try and do that. But either way, just so you know how to put in logs consistently. Um, just make sure if you do use a solver at any point, on the test or otherwise, it's a legit math mathematical step in this class to say, I used a solver. Once you get to this point, say, I used a solver and give me an answer, that is considered showing your work for this class. Um, you do have to show me this with all the correct units before you do that, though. Because that's really the tricky part, it's supposed to be the tricky part anyway. Once you get to this point, it's all just algebra. So, how do we undo? So, first off, I'm not thinking like physics in terms of you have to do your algebra before you plug in your numbers. I'm fine turning this into one number first. So, 0. 0.247 times 3.58 is what? Negative. 0. 0.85. 0. 0.85? 0. 0.885. In With it's sync bigs. For the for the sake of this class, point eight eight five and point eight eight four are the same number. That's the whole point of uncertainty, right? Is that last digit is plus or minus one. But if it makes everybody feel better, we can do it that way. <laughs> How do we undo natural log? What's the opposite of the natural log? E. And the way I always remember how to do this is that remember, natural log is solving for the exponent. It's E to something is equal to the natural log. So basically, we're going to do e to the power of each side. That cancels that out. And you get x over 745 equals e to the minus 0.884, which again is just a number. So plug it in and get a number. Okay. 
<laughs> so 0. 0.413 times 745 gives I'm so used to like uh, thinking about concentrations in moles per liter that seeing it in four and like making the mental jump to like, I don't need to do anything with it. It's really hard. I think that's where I got stuck. Originally. And it, so, and this is going to be the case for, for rates and equilibrium in general. You can use any unit that is proportional to concentration. So anything where it's a where it'd be a one step conversion between back and forth is is valid. Um, with equilibrium constants, it gets a little bit tricky because you need to have the right units on top and bottom. So equilibrium, especially, um, you, you get a different K value for equilibrium if you're in different units, which is why KP and KC are different. But for the sake of rates, especially first order rate, rates, because you have this one over, you have the A over A naught, any concentration unit works. Um, you just have, you're gonna have a different K value if you're in different, um, if you're in different units for zero and second order reactions. And if you look at this, the units of, of the rate constant, for zero order, it's molarity per second. For second order, it's inverse molarity per second. These ones, you're going to get a different K value of your different concentration units. You still can use any concentration units or anything that's proportional to concentration for them, but it'll be a different K value. But for first order, concentration units don't show up in the rate constant because of laws of laws for the same reason that in initial concentration doesn't show up down here. So do you want us to stay in like SI for zero order and second order? Or? For zero order and second order, absolutely. That's going to make your life a lot easier if you're consistent that way. And, and for first order, we get to skip that step. And what like other uh, um, examples would you give for like like what are other concentration units? Grams per liter, <clears throat> um, percent by mass, even like anything that you would be able to get to molarity is pretty much going to be proportional to um, to concentration. Because the steps are the same to get in and out. Exactly. And so you wind up in because of it's got that A over A dot term. <laughs> you know, like pressure, it's like QD equals energy. You yeah. divide both sides by volume, and you have oh, that. For I'm sure you have, you have it in terms of something else. Right. For the sake of this problem, though, if you're not going to go wrong putting it in molarity units. And in a lot of cases, if, if you're not sure about whether you should put in molarity units, do it. It's never going to be wrong to put in molarity units. It's just unnecessary sometimes. All right. Well, then we spent more time on that than I was planning, uh, which is fine. I was going to walk through the Excel steps to, to plot this in Excel and figure out if it's first order, second order, zero order in Excel based on data. I think we'll save that so we can get into talking about um, the Arrhenius equation, which again, is the same Arrhenius that defined, had the first definition of what an acid was, same Arrhenius who was the one who first published data on anthropogenic climate change in the 1880s. Um, he also is most famous for his, his um, I think he won a Nobel Prize for this. But I don't remember if he was before the Nobel Prize existed or not. Um, 
He was right there. But basically, the Arrhenius equation is the equation that, that ties Boltzmann distribution to rates. Boltzmann distribution and equilibrium existed as ideas before Arrhenius, and Arrhenius put the equation in the same form um, so that we can represent how activation energy and temperature affect rate, as well as um, as well as uh, affecting equilibrium. Right, so it's the same thing. I think I started our intro to kinetics by talking, doing a review of the Boltzmann distribution and looking at. The area under the curve gets bigger as you increase the temperature. Um, so a lot of this is kind of reviewing that. Right, this should look familiar, right? Better than I can draw it by hand, but really similar. As you increase the temperature, this Boltzmann distribution flattens out. And a larger fraction of the molecules are above that activation energy, above that threshold for the reaction to happen. So if more molecules, if a larger percentage of the molecules have enough energy to make it over that barrier, we should expect the reaction to happen faster, right? Up to a point. If we get the temperature up so high that our Boltzmann distribution looks like this, now increasing the temperature is going to further stretch it out, but if we already have 70, 80% of the molecules are already above that threshold, then going from 80% of the molecules to 81% of the molecules is not going to drastically affect the rate, right? Which is why if you looked at rate versus temperature, right? if you remember there was all those, that graph, uh, it was like an exponential growth, and then it sort of plateaued. And that plateau happens because you get to a point where increasing the temperature doesn't get you that much more change. This exponential growth phase happens because initially, when your choice is 5% of the molecules have enough energy and increasing the temperature makes it 10% of the molecules, that doubles your rate right there. Right, going from 5% of the molecules to 10% of the molecules twice as many molecules have enough energy now. But eventually that's, you reach a point of diminishing returns with that, and that's why it plateaus off. Right, and so, but if we're zoomed in at reasonable temperatures, that Boltzmann distribution flattening out, we're, we have to get to pretty high temperatures to see that plateau effect. Most of the reactions that are happening at a reasonable rate at room temperature, are still in that, that exponential growth phase. Um, and this right here, that's the Arrhenius equation. So and it should look familiar, right? Because for equilibrium, it was E to the minus delta G over RT. But for rates, it's not delta G, it's the activation energy, it's the peak energy. How high do you have to go before you can start going downhill again? Right, so very subtly different. And it also has this A term that's called the, the Arrhenius factor, which basically is a constant that's gonna be, it's based on the, the geometry of the reaction. Um, so if we said, if we're measuring Let's say that the chemical reaction we're measuring is cars rear-ending other cars. If we're talking specifically about a car rear-ending another car, then that means that one car has to be facing away from the other car, right? You can't get a rear-ending if both cars are coming towards each other. There's a geometric factor in these chemical reactions. They have to bump into each other facing the right direction as well. And that's all encapsulated in this A term. This is all you know, probability-based and geometry-based. And so that's going to be a constant for every reaction. Every reaction is going to have its own A. But then they, they all share this common um, form of the Arrhenius factor. It's E to the minus activation energy over RT.
And just like, no, oh, let's save that thought. So here's just a figure showing um, this led to what's called the collision theory of reactions, which is molecules have to bump into each other for a reaction to happen. Not exactly groundbreaking, but at the same time, if you think back to um, the idea of molecules is new. The idea that a chemical reaction happens because little tiny pieces run into each other is somewhat revolutionary. And it's at least something that needed to be like, put forward as its own explanation. It was not something that was self-evident when the idea of molecules was new. Um, to us, it seems really self-evident. So collision theory is just you have a before collision, you have an after, you have a collision, then you have an after collision, and you have different things on each side. This right here is the transition state. And to put it in math terms, it's the local max. It's the point where you get to where you can only go downhill in energy from either direction. The highest energy that you that you must get to between A and B. So it's the pass. We think about these potential energy surfaces like altitude. It's the pass between lake level and Carson. Like the climax. Yeah, it's not quite the true maximum. It's not the peak because like when you're going from here to Carson, you don't actually go to the top of the mountains, right? You go to the highest point that you need to before you start going back down. So if, if you visualize this as being a three-dimensional surface, it's a saddle point. It's concave up in the other dimension. It's concave down in one dimension. In, but that concave down part that's what we're looking for. That's the reaction. We're trying to find the lowest energy state between A and B. I mean, there's always higher energy states. The highest energy state would what if we what if we took all four of these atoms and just completely split them up entirely, broke all the bonds, and then we put them back together however we wanted to. That works too. It's just going to take more energy to do it than if we can just break one bond and make one one bond. It's going to be easier be lower in energy. And for those of you who are in math and want to think about concave up and saddle points and things like that, these reactions happen on an n-dimensional surface where n is the number of atoms. Because there is basically a huge number of different ways that you can take these four atoms and rearrange them. And most of those are not are going to be higher energy. Um, but if you get the larger reactions, you looked at like a 10, 10 atom reaction, that's on a 10 dimensional surface. Um, so this is one of those cases where you kind of just have to take the mathematician's word that the math still works if you go to higher orders, since we can't visualize what a 10 dimensional surface looks like. Um, but mathematically, we can treat it like it's a three dimensional surface. We can think about it like it's a three, dim three dimensional surface. Um, it's just that all of the other dimensions besides this one are higher in energy. Just like going to the left or to the right of Spooner Pass is higher in altitude than just staying in the middle of Spooner Pass. And if n-dimensional surfaces doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you don't worry. I spent five years of my life studying this stuff and it doesn't make much sense to me. Our brains just don't have the firmware to be able to process what higher spatial dimensions look like because we live in a three-dimensional universe. Um, I also really like Arrhenius's first name because it's very Scandinavian, Sponte, Sponte Arrhenius. That's a cool name. It is a cool name. Um, And the other term that you hear for A are the frequency factor, or I guess, I guess it's the pre Arrhenius factor. I've always heard it called the Arrhenius factor, um, or at least that's the way I remembered it. Either way, it's this term right there, and that's the one that's based on the geometry of for the reaction to happen, the green atom has to bump into the green atom. 
which means if this was rotated 180, if this one was rotated 180 and it ran into the green one, nothing would happen, right? So there's some geometry and some probability involved in how do we get these things, not just to run into each other, but run into each other facing the right way. But that's not part of the activation energy. The activation energy is just how fast does each, does each one need to be moving. So the nice thing about this being a familiar equation, or at least kind of familiar, slightly different. When we're talking about K for, for equilibrium constants, we had E to the minus delta G over RT. We could actually split that up and we could solve this. If we took natural log of both sides, we could get natural log of K equals negative delta G over RT. You guys remember doing this and turn this into a linear form of the equation. That was kind of a, a pain, but we could do it. And we could find, actually, we did that for the Borax now, right? We had to plot that. And then the slope of the line gave us delta H over R. We can do the same thing and get an equation that looks pretty similar for rate constants. It's just instead of getting entropy over T over R for our intercept, we get natural log of A, which is not as useful, but it's still just a constant. Then on the other side, we get activation, negative activation, energy activate. Did I say that right? It's one of those words where you say it too many times and then it sounds wrong. Negative activation energy over R as the slope. One over temperature as your X axis. The natural log of the rate constant is your Y. which means you really only need, if you know the rate constant at two different temperatures, that's all you need to figure out the activation energy for a reaction. And it's all you need to figure out the intercept. Basically, we're going back to algebra with this one. If you have, the, does everybody remember the two point method? If you have two points on a line, you can figure out what the slope of the line is and you can figure out what the intercept of the line is, right? The you know, tricky part is just that we have these log terms and this one over term in there, but it still works. You can still turn temperature into one over temperature and do rise over run. So you get something like natural log of your first point. Let's sit call this as, is point A. Natural log of A, A minus natural log of KB, that's our rise, right? That's our change in Y over one over temperature A minus one over temperature B. That's all we need to get the slope here, right? Just through, since I didn't leap through that, that concept, Back when we just had straight lines, we could say that our slope was equal to y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. That look familiar to everybody? We're doing the same thing here. It's just that our y is natural log of the number, not just the number itself. And our x is one over temperature, not just temperature. But it's the same math we've done before. If you were doing this in Excel, you could just plug it in and get your line of best fit, get your linear regression line, and get the slope that way. We don't have Excel handy. As long as we have two points, we can still get a number for our slope. Obviously, more points is better. So a lot of times you'll see these um, these problems with you know six temperatures and six rate constants, and then you would just want to you could just pick any in theory pick any two of them is enough to get your slope and therefore get your intercept. But more points is better, especially when you deal with experimental data. 
because then you can get a line of best fit and that's going to be even better than doing it by hand with two points. So natural. And again, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter as long as you're consistent with which one is A and which one is B. You don't have to go the bigger number minus the smaller number. Natural log of 2.5 e to the minus five. My, and you can clean this up with lots of logs if you wanted to. What do we get for a slope? Yeah, negative 9.11 times seven to the negative seven. Let's see, so these, yeah, that's good. Yeah, negative eighteen thousand. Yeah, that it seems like it should be a big number, not small. Eighteen thousand, but one hundred and twenty-five. So my guess is you forgot the parentheses are on the around the bottom. Oh, no, I switched my experience. Oh, that will do too. I don't trust that. That's great. That cuts It's still negative. Right? Yeah. It's still negative though. It is because of I think just how it lined it up. But that's fine because our, our term has a negative in it. Activation energy should always be positive, and R is always positive, so our slope should be negative because we have this negative term here. So negative 1.8 times 10 to the 4, 18,000. Yeah, that's it. That's unitless at this, I guess this is in Kelvin at this point. One over Kelvin? No, just Kelvin. Because we're multiplying times one over Kelvin and it needs to cancel out. Our, we were in one over one over Kelvin, which is just Kelvin. So if we multiply both sides by negative R, what's our activation energy? We have to use the R version that had joules, right? 8.314. So we should get something in the 1. Yeah, something in like 1.6 times 10 to the 5. Now we were in Kelvin multiplied by R, which is joules per mole Kelvin. So this is joules per mole. So we put it in kilojoules if we wanted the 150 kilojoules. Once we know our slope, Getting this intercept is not too tricky though either, right? Once we know the slope hit either of these two points, plug in natural log of K, plug in one over T, plug in the slope we calculated, solve for this term, which is gonna be a number. Uh, but that would be the frequency factor. And that means that's all we need. If we know the activation energy and we know A, that's all we need predict K at any temperature. We can figure out what the rate constant is going to be at any temperature based on those two terms, the activation energy and the frequency factor. All right, I know we're at time right now. 
Um, I just want I want to say that we're going to we will hang on the schedule has us taking the midterm in week six, which is next week. That really snuck up on us. Yeah. Um, so, but I want to get through the nuclear kinetics chapter first because, like I mentioned before, all nuclear reactions are first order reactions. So it makes the most sense to do the nuclear chapter before the midterm. So that means that we've got the next lecture and then next week, next Tuesday, we're going to do nuclear reactions and then review. And sometimes we do week seven, Tuesday of week seven or Thursday of week seven. So decide we'll have the midterms. So two weeks from today or two weeks from Thursday. Review. <laughs> It's so much. It's very good to see you guys.